<laughs> all right, all right. Welcome back on the gravel with your hosts, Raven Oliver, Oliver. and Raven. <laughs> Happy Monday! Happy Monday does not does not feel like a month. Is yeah, this comes it out. It is on a Monday. Sunday. But this we is are, coming out yeah, on a Monday. That threw me off for a second. Um, Don't you worry, we got it right. It is Sunday today. Race was last night. Absolutely great race. Very very happy with how. The viewing experience turned out for me. I don't know how about you, but I don't know. I mean, I lost my voice two laps into the race, but you know, we'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> so we'll start with the general paddock news, like we always do. Uh, main thing right now, Adrian Newey, kind of the talking point right now with where he might be going next year. And we all know with what's happening at Red Bull, the connections are not great with in. The organization, it's a huge problem just with, like, tensions and everything, so... I mean, yeah, you guys hear it every week. You're not surprised, yeah. but... We don't need to go over anything that's happening, but Adrian Newey is in talking stages with Ferrari, with... Seems to be in the direction of leaving Red Bull, and I feel like Ferrari is one of those teams that if they get one of those just guys like Newey... Oh, that, that's a absolute game-changer. You know, there's... It, Newey going to a team that's the second best car right now. You know, he definitely has the fundamentals and the abilities to push that team to fighting with Red Bull in that instance. You know, you know, Adrian Newey going to like a Haas or something, that's not going to change Haas and make them the best car on the grid. But somebody like Ferrari, who is a power unit supplier and just as good of a, a team as they are, Adrian Newey could definitely fit into that team and do something. I think and obviously that's where I want him to go. Yeah. But I think also too, it's like, they would be able to do a lot before the regulations change in two Almost years. Almost definitely. So it would be like really competitive then, and then it would be really interesting to see. With yeah, if, if Adrian Newey can, if Adrian Newey is going to leave Red Bull, I would much rather him do it pre twenty twenty six regulations, so he has a hand in crafting the car for the twenty twenty six regs. Absolutely. Happy one year of watching races to me. That's something I should have said, but happy <laughs> one year to you, Raymond. <laughs> thank you, Seriously, thank you. It's, it's, it's been good to have you it's very, watching races with very me. Very fun. Um, Aussie GP 2023 was Raven's first race with me. He came over one night. Race. I kind of forced him to watch F1 with me, and we <sighs> thankfully got one of the most exciting races of the entire year. You might be able to counter that with Las Vegas 2023 or or Zanvoort 2023, but the amount of just pure chaos chaos that went on last year in Australia was phenomenal for a new fan. So that really hooked Raven on. And, you know, we started watching every single race um, that year together. And obviously here we are now making a podcast on it. So it obviously worked. You know, my good graces, they seem to go, <laughs> go ways. So uh, Ferrari <laughs> was also the first team this week to roll out a minor upgrade to the car and i'm not understating when i say minor that this thing was about the size of like a this sd part. card for example <laughs> a great visual representation yeah, how big match this match. upgrade was <laughs> it was just a small wing like right over the rear uh diffusers to kind of just give a little more downforce i feel like but yeah and it work. obviously did <laughs> seemed to yeah, work. um george russell would say otherwise <laughs> but no it seems like it did nothing um, the Mercedes was awful this week, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, it was earlier stated by planet F1 that a contract clause was added to Max Verstappen's contract, um, that allows him to leave if helmet Marco leaves. And all this apparently was like done without the knowledge of any of the senior members at RBG and BH. I hate that. That's what they're. Parent, parent company is named. named. Yeah, it's I know. It's so frustrating to say out loud, but... It's just a giant acronym. This like, was released earlier in the week, and it's reported that the tensions at Red Bull have cooled off a bit, which, I mean, I think that's what the goal was if you're Red Bull, <laughs> to make this yep. die down just a wee bit. But, I mean... I feel like it kind of has. It has, but especially with how the race affected this weekend, I think yeah. you could argue that... The flame, literally, is <laughs> kind of underneath Red Bull again with just 
how that happened and then how Paris finished too. So I think both of those things combined relights that fire there. I was going to say, not a good weekend for Red Bull entirely. People are calling for Alpine to sell the team to Andretti Cadillac after the failed bid, but no. I say let the French See, struggle. I think this is where we differ. I think you you don't agree. I am okay with it. I I understand being okay with it, but I my main thing is like this team is already an established team with history. And I think having another competitor come in and just make it more competitive overall. Yeah. I think that is better than letting kind of what happened. Like, we don't know if Andretti is going to even stay. That's true. That point. So like, it, but if they get their own team, they're kind of forced to stay. And I think that's more of the position of the F like FIA and F1 specifically. That's like true. that's, what their decision kind of goes off of. Well, I'm thinking it's like with Alpine, how do you go about hiring new staff? Do you, you know, like how do you go about doing that? Or are you so far gone already three races into the season that you would even consider doing something like selling the team? Like, I don't think they're going to do it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but if they were to sell to, to Andretti Cadillac, I wouldn't, be opposed to it at all i don't think like i i, I just think andretti could do such good things for that team like i i, I want andretti in the sport yeah but. i do too and i think that's where we agree but the failed bid obviously makes sense for right now it's the middle of the regulations try again 2026 i think that's when your best odds are going to happen especially when you have audi rolling out and becoming a new uh engine supplier and power supply unit so like yeah I think with that, they also have the ability to be like, oh, we can do like a team thing here where we now use the Audi power supply units instead. Like That's true. I just think there's more room for that. And like, you know how there's Red Bull and then there's V-Carb and then mm -hmm. you could say Ferrari and Haas are like true. the same kind That's of fair. thing with that. But maybe kind of get that kind of situation going. With like an Audi... Andretti partnership in, in the sense that you in know, the sense of like you send one to one team and then Audi's like the main team. Yeah. I think that would also be a really good way to get some more young guys into the sport and overall just feed the sport competitively. So yeah, that's, that's definitely, I, I would like to see that as I, I'd actually be okay with that. If you know, Andretti actually, acclimates into f1 well and they do become a front runner if they have a team like andretti join the sport um become a an engine purchaser from them um if they if audi wants to you know become that mercedes that ferrari and have that prestigious driver academy where maybe they route drivers through andretti to get them into the audi yeah, car i think that's like, a great yeah, I, route I, for them i'd be fine with that I think it it would also. But then you you also you have to think, what are Andretti's goals? Because obviously somebody like Mario Andretti wants to be a constructors champion, yeah. have a drivers champion under his name. So, but that's where I think they're different enough where you can have that fluidity between the two, and mm -hmm. you know, maybe with one car, like say one driver is just like I don't know, like mid-season swap with like equal contenders just because the cars yeah. are slightly different maybe one's higher drag one's better in the corners so it's like the thing with alex i mean he's doing a lot better at williams compared to his red bulls i mean it's his team now at, at this point it is his team after we, after we this, saw this week, week. Yeah, we'll get there i think it's time to move on from the alpine point but it is it's a very interesting thing i mean it's it's a lot, but I'll let you take the next point if you want to. Yeah, so Mercedes uh, Director of Driver Development, Jerome D'Ambrosio, he used to drive in F1 for Toro Rosso in 2009, I believe. I know he drove in the 2009 season. Um, I can't remember how long he stayed in F1 for. It might have been 2011, if I want to say correctly. Like 40 races, I believe. Yeah, yeah he, it was record. max three seasons. Absolute peak three seasons. Um, he's leaving with Lewis this year to Ferrari, and that's you know just another issue mercedes is having they're losing so much 
personnel in that team right now. They get Bono. Yeah, I was gonna say. I was gonna. So that's, I'm wondering. That's a that's a big thing. Does Bono then become George's race engineer, or does he become Fernando? Fernando Alonso. I hope Fernando. <laughs> that would be an exciting duo. Oh, that'd be crazy. But yeah, it's just it's another person that Mercedes have to replace. It's gonna be hard, for and them. It, it feels like Alpine. Like it, Mercedes feels like a mini Alpine situation kind of thing. So, At least from a personnel standpoint, should have been something we said last week, but news wasn't fast enough. However, four to five episodes ago, we talked about Stake having a lot of troubles with just the sponsorship of Stake in the team. And during the race this weekend, they had to go under the name Kick Sauber because of Australia's strict gambling laws. And, you know, give it to them for having online gambling laws because... I was going to say, full the full team name is Stake F1 Team Kick Sauber. Um, and to have to strip off half of the team name for half of the races, that obviously leads to concern. Like... We, we, we talked it's about a sponsorship issue at the end of the day. Exactly. And we talked about this with the Swiss government and how they see um, their own online gambling laws where it's obviously this translate translates over to a lot of different countries. How much money is stake really paying you to have that title title sponsorship where you're willing to cut them out for half to of have the races? Kick just do it. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good point where I think like, I don't know the legality of it, and hopefully one day we can talk to someone who is a sponsor, but at this point in time, we can only speculate where I feel like as a sponsor, that doesn't make you happy. If I don't. The one thing you're paying for is, you know, viewability of the car. It's like kind of an issue with the Red Bull sponsors right now where their mm-hmm. car is just never on screen besides the first and last lap. So... It, it just, it's like, okay, do I get my money back for this? Or next year, do we get a pay cut? Or there's just so many aspects of it that really just change kind of how you go about it in yeah. a way. But do you make kick the main? And then you do like... See, I feel like kick is so much less... Um, oh, what's the word? It's a streaming platform. It's a, I was, it's, so, it's controversial. Yeah. It's so much less controversial. There's no, I mean. And you can still give stake almost the exact same amount of actual um, land yeah. on the car. Like, y- you don't have to reduce how much um, you don't have to stake swip, sponsorship swip, is on the car. Switch the, um, God, I can't think of the word. What side pod sponsor, no, like main just, sponsor? Well, yeah, but like, what's the livery? That's the word I'm. Thinking yeah, yeah, of. you don't have to change the livery at all. So, it's just one of those things where it's like it's a co- all contract and business sided. So, we don't really know that, sadly, as fans. We kind of just but, have to sit on and watch. Yeah, but we're working on getting some guests. Hopefully, they can let us inside, but probably not. Yeah, we can inside with them. Um, <laughs> I have a. Sub point on Kick Sauber that Beltry Botas has pencil legs. He did an insanely cool commercial with um, Uber Car Share. Yeah, it was great. It was a great commercial. He was dressed in this color exactly, I think. But sorry for your audio only listeners. I'm wearing a light blue shirt, but he is just built with pencil legs and it is the epitome of F1 driver. And I, yeah, it's like, oh, boy. but it was. Honestly, honestly, like that to me, that commercial was Super Bowl commercial esque. Yeah, and it, I love the timing of it, where the joke of this is Valtteri's home race, going oh, yeah. on for years since he's been at Mercedes, I believe, mm-hmm. and just be. I mean, his girlfriend is Australian as well. Like so that checks out. Uh, like Australia is kind of like a second home for Valtteri, so. I, I'm not surprised that a lot of people call this his home race. Which I think is great. I think is absolutely I think, I think it's great. So nice. he, he feels so good around here, too. Like, he's had here. success around here. In the we are in Chicago, my guy. Sorry. <clears throat> he's had a lot of success in Australia in the past. So, it's. I mean, it's been a happy hunting ground for him. So, I'm not surprised. It's crazy. He man. loves it there. 
FIA investigation news has led to some powerful claims with the FIA president, Ben Salem. Lewis Hamilton stated in an article somewhere um, that he has never had his confidence, which... It's a big point if it's Lewis if, Hamilton I was saying say, If it's it. Lewis saying it, you know there's going to be a lot of other people that kind of have this viewpoint. I think universally on the grid, I would say probably majority. Uh, Lewis actually has the backing and name to speak out more than a lot of other people. If a guy do. like Zhao did it, no one's gonna. Everyone's just gonna start ripping him. Yeah, exactly. But like, but the okay, amount of people that respect Lewis, Lewis and are like, Lewis it. is my role model. I <laughs> I stand whatever he I says. I hate you now, Ben. <laughs> it's like okay, no, it's it's rough. I think overall, it's not great. Just it's in not a good look. It's, it's not, not a good, good look, look, but it's not a great relationship between FIA and F1. If one of them has, if the drivers of one company don't have faith in the governing body, it's mm -hmm. it becomes this issue where I feel like a lot of American sports have, you know, like player um, contracts with like uh, for like player rights and all that stuff. Oh yes. Um, media contracts and all that but like it gives in a way the p players more power or alternating power yeah. but you don't have that in f1 so you have a governing body mm -hmm. and do the drivers have a say in who's in the body even i don't believe i, so. I don't think so because it's a different company yeah so Drivers Where's are just the middle there to drive. Yeah. Drivers are just there to drive. Where's the middle ground between the two, I believe? So there is the Drivers Association. Okay. I didn't know that, but that yeah. is good to know. So there's probably that is the middleman in my yeah. opinion. But But they don't get to call for the axing of Mohammed uh Ben Ben Salim. <laughs> like they don't get to they don't get to do that. Yeah, but you can protest. I mean you American sports have had lockdowns. I know basketball's had like three in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Baseball had one a few years ago after before COVID, I believe. So it's I guess is it like that important to them then? Yes. I think well like that we can talk about that with the Fernando penalty. <laughs> yeah. So um, like if last year didn't he get isn't he being investigated for last year? On a Jedi. penalty, yeah, Jetta for the first three races with Fernando Alonso. Okay, is he now just like overstepping his grounds and being like, okay, I'm if this is what the people want, we're gonna just axe him so hard. But if you look at the timesheet, it dropped him two places on the grid. Yeah, so not detrimental. We're definitely overall, get but into that Alonso penalty yeah. in a little bit because that that really aggravated me. Just like a lot of stuff. That actually, I was angry this weekend. This whole weekend was not a great look. I'll let you get into the next point because anger takes this great segue. Yeah, so Susie Wolf took legal action against the FIA and claimed that they made uh, they made it against her and her husband over the winter. With actually calling them out, the um, driver insider information with FIA Academy and all that. It was a huge issue over the summer. Oh, over the winter. My apologies, but mm -hmm. if you watched or like saw any tweets about it, it was just. Wife of Formula One team principal Toto Wolf like is getting sued, and I saw a lot of people pointing out where it's like, okay, she has a name. First off, it's Susie Wolf, and yeah. if you say that name to people, they're gonna know who she is just from being in the sport and being one of the, the most head notable of the female F1 Academy. Yeah, it's, it's like, like one of the most notable female heads in Formula One. Or, or, or just motor racing, it's, period. It's, European motor racing, period. It's frustrating. It's unbelievably disrespectful. It's frustrating and rude, and yeah, it's just not not the move overall. But that leaves us going over to the actual race. And pre-race news, there wasn't too much. It was mainly just with signs if he was going to be racing or not. Mm -hmm. And he said a lot over the weekend that... He knows the risk. He hasn't been training. He hasn't been doing anything. He's just been in bed recovering from the appendicitis surgery. 
And we we kind of thought this might give Behrman another chance. It could it could have to been, prove himself. But obviously, Signs was feeling it. I think obviously rest is also never a bad thing. Of course, or you just kind of are like let's take a break and just mm-hmm. go into it. I know I can trust myself, and I think that's kind of what he did because obviously he won the race. That that's a we don't that's need a, a, we don't need to gatekeep that information. It's a beautiful thing, but, guys. Max Verstappen did not win. <laughs> <laughs> but going over to practice, Alex Albon absolutely slams his car on turn nine. Turn six. Turn six. And he did that last year, too. Exact same corner in the race, causing a red flag. But this time he did it in practice, and that's where the controversy comes in. And we're going to be sticking on this point for a little while on a debate, but that's okay. This is the point that aggravated me the most out of the entire week. Not even not even the race weekend. The entire week. This, this ruined my week, honestly. I woke up, I saw this, and I threw my phone at the wall. So, James Vowles now has a very difficult decision to make given Alex has totaled his car to the point where the chassis cannot be repaired um, quick enough to participate in any of the rest of the race weekend. Not even FP3 qualifying next day on Saturday. He can't even race. It's that bad. So you now have two drivers in one chassis. Who do you think is going to race in the car? Oh, of course, it's going to be Logan Sargent, the guy who didn't total his car Kind of checks out. That's kind of what happens when you shank it into the wall. You live with your actions. James Vowles had a very difficult decision to make where he sat down. He said he sat down. He looked at the numbers um, and told Logan Sargent that he had to sit out for the rest of the race weekend and give his chassis to Alex Albon to race. And that is what happened. My guy was looking at Excel spreadsheets and was like, "Mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like You're it. out. <laughs> yeah, like, happy birthday, Alex. It's your teammate's car. I was going to say, because on Saturday, on, on qualifying day, was Alex Albon's birthday, the day that he was gifted Logan Sargent's chassis. So um, stupid. But I, like, I personally think this is horrific. It's a bad it, look for Williams, too. I mean... Because it, it, it's it's two different things. It's unprofessional from F1 as an organization, from an F1 organization, sorry, I tripped over my words there, to not have a spare chassis because I'm pretty sure almost every team in Australia had a spare chassis. A counter with it's a lot of things to bring over from New York. That's true, and it, they're a smaller team. They're a smaller team. They're going to try to cut budgets when they can. And I think that's just one of those places where it's like it's so expensive to travel with this that we can probably cut it out and save a lot of money and try to do stuff with that money otherwhere. So I think the points you're making are all true. And yeah, it's it's not fair to Logan Sargent because you just essentially said I was gonna say it puts we don't a bad, trust you. Yeah, it puts a bad taste in both Albon and Sargent's mouth because now if you are Logan Sargent, you're just waiting for Alex Albon to crash and take your chassis yeah, again. I mean, um, and then and then for Alex Albon, it's wow, I have so much pressure on me because um, if I crash, I'm stealing my teammate's car and I'm still expected to perform again. Like Alex, you know, is now being expected to perform at the absolute highest level every single race to the point where they're willing to sacrifice the other driver for his own driving capabilities because of the numbers like B- because the numbers we're not the and Oakland James A's Vowles, James Vowles didn't even say that it was due to anything that happened last year he said it was specifically off the numbers of the first two races of the season like neither of them scored any points in the first two races like it just, that just blows my mind yeah that's like, a great point to point out too but I just remember looking at, the, so he also does, James Val does little like fireside chats on his Instagram. Yeah. And oh yeah, the one thing I just remember everyone saying, it's like, yeah, this is great. We get like an insider look to kind of what he's thinking and what he's actually doing. But at the same time, everyone just complains to, yeah. for him to get a better camera, which it's like, if you're Williams, just like give him an iPad and... <laughs> Like let the him iPad cook. Is, 
James Vowles needs an iPad. Let's be real. If he's crunching the numbers to see which one of his drivers is actually going to race, and he's like, "Oh, whoop de dooter, uh, you're out." What? What do you, do like, you think? Do you think he's on the Ward family home 1995 Christmas video camera? <laughs> like, I think he might be on the same, you know, handy cam Sony cam that we're on. That's but fair. he has good lighting, though. You can't get, oh, you can't get him. For he that. has one. Light above us. We have two. But I, I don't want to. I don't want to tangent away from the bigger issue with James Vowles. But I mean, yeah. So stealing another driver's chassis to cover for the mistake of another driver, I think, is like, I t- like to me. Sure, performance is everything. You're you're trying to score every single point possible. But when neither of them have scored any points at all this season, I think it is completely unjust and unfair. And untrusting of Logan of Logan Sargent to steal his chassis from him, it, it, it's you as Logan Sargent. You have to think, why am I even racing at all now? Like to me, that would be so unbelievably demoralizing to be told straight up, your teammate is better than you, yeah, and that's my... he will get your car uh, like in any strenuous situation whatsoever. That's my biggest issue. Is like. Why do you have them? Like, mm-hmm. if, if you don't trust him enough to, like, let him go out there and prove himself, I mean, it's okay, it's not your rookie year anymore. You're a little late to prove yourself, but now you're just fighting to keep your seat. Yeah. How are you, how are you how able are to you fight, able to, keep to, fight to keep Yeah, like, if that's it's stolen from you. That's just not fair to him at all. And so taking that precedent and, you know, I don't think other teams do this. Aston Martin has never done that. I mean, Max Verstappen said he'd pancake his car yeah. if <laughs> <laughs> I have that point later where he's Max Verstappen is Logan's biggest supporter, supporter and proved it in the race where he's like, if he's not racing, I'm not racing. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, yeah, why race at all? Terrible look on the team. But at the end of the day, it's like. What, yeah, do, you, what do you do as Logan now? Like, like do you, how do you wholeheartedly put like at your effort that also, into this? That also, that's a whole nother week's worth of racing that he does not have under his belt. Like he, he essentially took a week on a off. track that like, in my opinion is one of the harder ones because of how narrow it is. Just yeah, like Canada. Canada is a hard track just because of how narrow the streets are actually are. And to Zandvoort the walls. as well. Yes. Zandvoort's another huge one. It's, it's small things like that where it's like, okay, the track might not have, you know, 27 turns like Jeddah, but at the end of the day, Australia, I mean, I can say from two races that I've seen there, it mm-hmm. has done the most damage to any, like, to all the cars. Yeah. There was, what, three red flags last year. And then we had Alex's massive crash this year and Logan's, or not Logan, sorry, uh, George's crash um, during the race this year. All the it's same not, corner. All, yeah, way. it's like, it's a hard track and it's proven itself to be a great watch. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been a great watch. Both, but the both issues the that have years. also come from it, I think kind of nuances in a way where it's like your roommate was saying last night where it's like Mickey Mouse winner. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, you don't have the two greatest names in the race, like the signs get that credibility? Yes, he obviously should. Well, and it's important to know that, uh, that my father's going to be mad when I say this, <laughs> but every single time Carlos Sainz has won a Grand Prix, Max Verstappen has had an issue. There was a setup issue in Silverstone 2022 for both the Red Bulls. In Singapore uh, 2023, the Red Bull just wasn't there. And now you have Max Verstappen's Thank the Lord, mechanical retirement. <laughs> He's not there. So it, it is. It, he put it well. It's like Mickey Mouse winner. Like, don't, do not discredit Carlos Sainz. Do not Sainz. put an asterisk. Do, there, this is not this an asterisk winner. win. This no. is not an asterisk win. Absolutely Esteban not. Ocon 2021 hungry is, is an asterisk win. This is not an asterisk win. Um, Lewis Hamilton, eighth championship. <laughs> A- Asterix. <laughs> Felipe Massa's missing championship. Asterix. <laughs> um, but yeah, don't discredit Carlos Sainz, but Max Verstappen being out of the race, definitely. I, I could see where some people would say Mickey Mouse winner, Mickey Mouse championship. Like, yeah, it's it's that's definitely 
looming, I guess. We're going to take a quick little break and de-stress and come back. So uh, <laughs> We'll get right into qualifying <laughs> We'll after. get right back into qualifying and all the action that I actually pursued this weekend. So we'll be right back, everyone. All right. Well, we're back. back. Got a little food in me now. Went over Leclerc 2022 France. Watched the rock, um, Rocket Power Mohawk. Yep, thank you. His little clip about the Team LH meltdown, which was <laughs> very, very, very entertaining. entertaining. We're going to get into that in just a couple of minutes, uh, actually. So, um, starting with qualifying. It wasn't a super exciting qualifying session, I want to say, but there was definitely one major shock that we saw when we watched live, which was Lewis Hamilton going out in Q2 on merit. Um, it's not like he had any issues, <clears throat> excuse me, or anything. Mercedes was just the sixth best car in quality trim. Um, the setup wasn't right for them. The car upgrades weren't working like they thought. They were the, I mean, given Sonoda's insanely good qualifying on merit, given there was nothing crazy in the qualifying session, you had Red Bull, Ferrari, Aston Martin, McLaren, and RB ahead of Mercedes. Like, it was very difficult to watch. I mean, George Russell was the highest qualified Mercedes, and he only qualified P7. Um, it was it was very tough to watch from their standpoint. It was also difficult to see Ferrari not really extract as much as we thought that they would. We definitely thought Ferrari, post-practice especially, would be in the fight for pole position. Um, but Charles made a mistake on his last run. He probably would have been on the front row if not. Um, but yeah, the Ferraris definitely should have been challenging for pole and they weren't. So that was a bit disappointing to see, but it, it didn't really matter when it came to the race. Um, and with that, um, you know, it was Raven's first race repeat and we were hoping for a bit of action and it delivered. So it I'll let you, I'll let you did. take it off the line, off the five red lights. Right away, Max seems to have a problem with his car. And, you know, watching the first two laps. We're seeing we, a bit of smoke develop. We see signs overtake him, which <laughs> we start screaming at the <laughs> <team before. laughs> New leader for the <laughs> It was the first, it was the third leader of the year at that point and mm -hmm. he kind of maintained that lead for 90 percent of the race afterwards which was great and it seemed like it was a cooling issue from first glance just because like the commentator said it wasn't coming from the center part of the car so it wasn't really an engine issue i was gonna say it was coming from that left rear tire of max verstappen it, it's, it was actually the right it was the back right tire and oh thank you you're right um it you know he started saying fire fire which th he was correct there was a fire i was gonna say and we were seeing like so much smoke come out of the back of the car and as on he the was screen. entrancing I mean, the we lane. were screaming at this oh, point yeah. like uh, i love max verstappen i'm not a max verstappen hater whatsoever it's just it's, it's nice just to shocking. see the it's, it's nice just shocking. It's shocking it's nice to see the race open up um but yeah you had a giant I don't want to say giant, but you had an explosion on his car when he was. It was coming the tire the exploding. Lane. Yeah, and it was big enough to be like, "Whoa, <laughs> that wasn't good." And they ripped the tire off, and then you just see you could the, see it like melting yeah. off, and like and then you looked at the actual off. brake ducts mm -hmm. and and the brakes itself, and it was all melting away. And so this was the end of his forty three race finishing streak, which. Very impressive. Funny enough, the 44th race backwards was Australia 2022, wow. where he had a mechanical failure. So he just doesn't have luck. Over Max there. cannot go back to back Australian GPs <laughs> finishing, <laughs> which, hey, that's just luck of the draw. But it is. Max said in his interview that the rear brake just like engaged and never disengaged his exact w words were the brake got stuck and then the temperature just skyrocketed and yeah started making the car unstable and ended up catching fire and, and breaking saw, the entire car i was so. gonna say a lot of i saw a lot of people on the internet being like okay so since the brake engaged why was he not driving five miles an hour and it's like 
it's so hot that the friction is being canceled yeah, out by melted. the heat. So that's why Max was able to keep up with science for so long um, before it became so bad that it ended up exploding. Um, but it was it was really disappointing for Max. But it at that point, three, four laps in, it completely opens up the race given Sergio Perez's grid drop that he got during qualifying. I should have mentioned that. Sergio Perez got a grid drop in qualifying for impeding Nico Hulkenberg. Um, on his final lap in Q2. So Paris started P6. So that, that really opened up the race for the two Ferraris, the two McLarens, Perez as well, and then Russell and Alonso. Even I Stroll. Mean, even mm-hmm. Stroll as well. So, I, mean, I was going to say Stroll started very highly in this race. He started higher also, than Alonso. The battle of the back was insane this race. You know, P9 to P12, I feel like kind of was changing almost every lap and then it kind of settled in towards the end once the Haases kind of secured the nine and ten finish for him which congrats to them that's big but there was no red flags which, which was good there wasn't even was a safety say, car that there was no real safety car but there was the virtual safety car and for eventually what? for what was that for <laughs> well we had a uh, one for our glorious Max Verstappen, and the other one was for Lewis Hamilton's engine failure, which I don't know if you've heard the audio in the clip of like the onboard, no, I've but it, seen it quite literally is going, and then he just starts rolling, and he's it's not good, and it, it was it, it was in a horrible part of the track as oh, well. Absolutely, it was in the the fast left right in the in the middle of the second nine sector. ten, mm-hmm. and that's where he pulled over and. That's where the second one was at during lap 17. So rough weekend overall for Mercedes. And obviously... Rough, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, once we get to the end of the race, you're going to realize it's a rough weekend for all world champions on the grid. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, you know, with Max out and Lewis... I mean, Lewis was nowhere anyways because the Mercedes was so bad. But yeah, Science took the lead in that second lap. Obviously, Raven and I were screaming... In excitement, uh, in excitement, but then you had, you know, what we we hoped for, which was going to be the charge from Lando, the charge from Charles and Oscar as well. Quick little Alonzo lead during some pits too. So yeah, was, I mean, everybody was there. I it mean, was if, a great race overall. So we can't look at this and be like, oh, meh, asterisk, Mickey Mouse winner. You know, no, because Carlos dominated. Yeah, no, he absolutely dominated like like no, the, the second max was out carlos took that and ran it i believe it was like lap 12 i want to say where they're like okay signs plan a mm-hmm. and they never looked back from that so i mean at one at one point carlos had like a nine second lead mm-hmm. to charles and p2 like what, it, what he said at the end though was was sweet when he crossed the lap where he's like tell carlos to come close to so we can finish like I was gonna say, one yeah, and two. Carlos but then I immediately down. looked at you and was like, cool, he can't catch up. It's virtual safety car. There's Delta Oh, yeah, base. the virtual safety like, car. He can't race. speed up or he's going to get a penalty. So I think that was all just a ploy to get Oscar and Lando on the podium instead. But nah. um, yeah, I mean, it's just... Overall, it was kind of weird in some aspects of like team strategy. Yeah, you had the McLarens during like la- mid twenties. I think it was right after Oscar pitted for the first time. Yep, where they let Lando by. Yeah, since Lando was on a different strategy. You had uh, Ferrari was kind of just like acceptance. Carlos is in the lead. He's winning the race. Charles, do your own thing. But it's like okay, I understand that. I believe there was like five seconds at that point. Ended up at like six or seven. Mm -hmm. I think it was a nine at one point. Um, But why switch them? And I understand like tire strategy and just Lando had the better tire strategy at the end of the day. Yeah. But let him, let him have it for a little bit longer. I feel like I was going to say, just let them race that too. Like just let them pass on merit. But and I, I guess feel it's like because they, they definitely there wasn't wanted to, they wanted that, to protect from Perez. That, yeah, that's what that it was. was a huge thing too. That but was one, great, but then it was like once great. Perez overtook Russell, his pace disappeared. Like 
They Once were like, he, oh, it's going to catch up to the McLarens. And then immediately it was like, oh, no, for Russell's rest, staying with Perez the entire time. And then, so, for the, yeah, for the rest of the race, Sergio was like nowhere. just as far behind um, Oscar as he was 30 laps earlier. Like nothing happened. So it was actually, it was very depressing if you're a Sergio Perez fan. And it, it, it wasn't good to see. Like that was Perez's race to win at that point. It was what I was saying about Haas earlier in the back of the pack was the them battling with Alex mainly. They I think yeah. it was uh Nico passed him first and then almost right away Hulk was fighting <laughs> to pass him. And that's him. the thing with with not having two cars, you have like no other no alternate def- strategy. Yeah, so you, you have no defensive or decoy or anything like that. So Alex was a sitting duck. Mm-hmm. And Haas took major advantage of it then got rewarded with some luck after you know the grid rearranged at the last lap so i was gonna say let's get into that actually i think the george russell incident on the last lap is a a huge talking point from this race almost as much as max verstappen um retiring but yeah you had george russell chasing fernando alonso in the closing stages for p6 in the race um and on the last lap of the race, you had a bit of, I don't want to say questionable, but to the stewards, obviously, it was questionable quoted, defense. Quoted unusual maneuver from Fernando Alonso, which which is what unquote, caused the crash. And Fernando Alonso was cited for breaking about a hundred meters before the typical breaking point that he used for the entire race at turn six. And apparently that caught George out and forced him to go into an evasive maneuver or he just wasn't ready for it. And he spun off the track, hit the wall and flew back onto it. So he was George, obviously out of the race. Alonzo's given a 20 second penalty, which ends up going from P6 to P8. So he drops behind, behind Yuki. His, yeah, behind his stroll. teammate. So and, and Yuki. nothing huge but, as a penalty. But... The main thing that really kind of sticks out for me is... It's the fact that, that is George crashing Fernando's fault whatsoever? Yeah, I think that is the base point of it. But, like, I think the main point you want to make is, like, where's the line between trying something new and, like, drivers just being, like... I'm doing this like, intentionally to... That, but also, like, the driver's reactiveness towards the, like, late end of the race. I can understand where it's like, oh, George's, you know, they're 58, 57 laps into this race. It's hot. Yeah. It's still summer there. It's going into fall. But where is that line where it's like, okay, I want to try something new on this and see how it works for me and if it gives me a better position. I was gonna say, I, is that my fault then for is the driver just, behind me? Yeah, not breaking or being aware that I might try something new. Like I can mm-hmm. understand in a race situation, everything's going so fast. I, Think like, about the first lap: twenty cars within a hundred meters, a uh, hundred meters of each other. You have to react to what's going on with the other car. So why is it any different? Fifty-seven laps into the race, I, th- I mean, it's tiredness. Like at the end of the day, these guys are still athletes. They're of losing course. a lot of water, and it's a lot of G forces throwing your body around, and you don't have time. You, they're going around the track in a minute and nineteen seconds, so you don't you ha- you don't have much time. I understand that, but. Mm-hmm. I don't personally think that Alonzo should be given this penalty just a because 20 second time penalty. So funny enough, what it was, was he was given a drive through penalty, but since it was after the, the race, the it was converted to 20 seconds, but a drive through penalty for that incident. Even is incredible. then it's like, so if I made a defensive maneuver into that corner, am I, st- and he crashes, is that my fault now? No. So be, wait, you didn't touch. And that's the other point is there was no contact they, they between weren't, the cars. He wasn't even close to him. Like, so that's my thing is like, I don't know why you are being punished for trying to do a different racing line. And it's hard, like being behind someone. Yeah. You're going to have to break, you know, your, your tires might not be as good. Yeah. I might not have grip, which 
on that part of the track. I'm going to give it to you. That is a pretty hard braking zone. And then immediately having to release and gas into a quick into corner next two, two corners. Yeah. So I understand that there's risk there. But at the same time, I don't understand why you aren't allowed to try something new. Uh, it's the last lap of the race. You're trying to... We saw this at... Uh, Brazil at the end of last year with where Alonso and Perez were battling out for P3. Yep. They were not doing the diff. They were doing different lines every single, like those last eight laps. I want to say, yeah, each one of them was a different single line. So forcing defensive moves going on. Attacking so there's from a, the bat- outside, there's from the a battling aspect, but George Russell being like, yeah, that's his fault when you're not in a like, in an opportunity, there's no gap, first off. Ayrton Senna He's not overtaking no, into that corner. No. Whatsoever. So why does it matter to, like, give him this huge penalty yep. when yep. it's not really his fault at the end of the day? It's not. And George Russell is getting a lot of flack on social media for it because he blamed Fernando. I mean... Props to them not blaming them on during the race, but like yeah. it coming out and being like, "Yeah, that's Lando's fault." I think you should be you like, mean "Okay, Alonso's fault." Yes, sorry, Alonso's <laughs> fault. Um, I think you have to kind of look at yourself and be like, "I think I definitely played a part of that too, where I just didn't react right and yeah. did the wrong thing and crashed my car." And you know, luckily, obviously, he's safe and okay, but that's a scary crash, man. Exactly. So, but I, it's, I mean, it's rough. I think it's it's important to bring it back to the the highlight of the weekend, which was. I want to make the one quick point: was yeah. was he trying to kill his future teammates? So no, could, so he could be the number one driver. <laughs> just, <laughs> he'll be the number one driver there just by performance. Let's be real. But speaking shout, of performance, shout out to Lance Stroll too. He had a good race. He did good, clean race. That's what that's what you're paying him for. I'm proud of him. But I wanted to. Hopefully I wanted his dad is too. <laughs> hey, he's just driving there for fun, bro. <laughs> but yeah, no serious. Serious congrats to Carlos and his performance this weekend. Because you you have to think he had no training the past few weeks um, with his appendicitis sur- uh, surgery. So to get back in and win a race immediately is incredible. Yeah. Um, Counterpoint to, to that. Yeah. Perez finishing P five with your teammate out obviously is a major dent in your reputation, I would say. Especially yeah, that, where you're, that, when you're kind of in the hot seat already for your seat in the next year, two years. When Max was in the pits on lap four, that race was on a platter for Sergio. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you can say strategy. You can say whatever you want. I, I think it was his pace. His pace period was just not there. Yeah. I mean, P5. Okay. There was still four better cars, two better teams. Yeah. Take your losses, bro. But where do you, where does he go? Genuinely, Ow. where does he, <laughs> just done, retire, spend time with your family? Yes. Don't cheat on your wife again. <laughs> no Monaco <laughs> yacht parties. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think he's made that statement. I believe they're having another or just had a kid, so he's at like yeah. five now. So it's gonna yeah, take time retire, for them, man. Yeah, retire. Spend some spend some time with your kids. Train We're, them to be a driver. We're coming into the end of it now, and that's okay. Um Yeah. I mean appendicitis. I, crazy saw, thing. I saw a whole edit, which I wasn't gonna say this, but it's funny. But you know how he is like he has his pancake recipe. Carlos signs his pancake oh, yeah. recipe is out. I got to try that thing. And so it's like there's clips of him like eating the raw batter. Mm-hmm. And then people were like salmonella. And then <laughs> salmonella actually affects the appendix. And okay. So like people were like, okay, maybe his pancakes led to the Carlos signs his pancake recipe led to him winning the 2024 Australian GP, the butterfly effect. <laughs> I love every butterfly effect <laughs> meme out there. They're so great. Yeah. Because you can't no, prove them wrong. I think it was a it was a great race. Seriously. Yeah. Overall, and great race. 
happy for Ferrari as well. We got a lot more information to go over if you thought this podcast was over. No, you got another like 15 minutes, brother. Yes, sir. We're going to go over to a reoccurring segment here. It's an important segment. Top five or not five. Top five or not five. Legendary segment here. And... There's not much to go over, but there's enough to go over, which is all that matters. So There's a top five, and there's a not five, there and that's is. all that matters. Starting with the top five, although I appreciate the dominance of Max Verstappen, I think we can all agree that this race was better without him there. I think it was. And you can say that because it wasn't his fault. It was God's fault. And if a you want to argue that, a Max Verstappen championship wah, wah. is a competitive championship. Facts. Uh, very clean race too. Also, first opening start that I have seen where no contact was made. Yeah, not even a tap. Not even uh, nothing. It was beautiful. It, it was, was very nice. It was very beautiful and clean. That's what we wanted to see. I think there was a uh, pep talk going into the race where they were like, "Don't freaking do last year again, buddy." Another important point. Haas scoring even cleaner points than they did last week. Absolute money. Steal you know, if you from thought them. that if you thought that crazy Kevin Magnus in defense in Saudi Arabia was worthy of a point, how about just two cars racing, racing in the points on Merit? Absolutely, I, like you can't be mad at them. It's great. They're awesome. convincingly better than a few of these cars below them on the grid. Last top five point is going to go to me just for. Being able to watch races now and be like, I have context. About He's got everything. Th- this and that's week, what matters. Guys, he has context clues from last year. That's all that matters. So excited for that. We'll go over to the not five real quick, which <sighs> kick Sauber. Got to change your tires faster, man. Dude, they have wheel nut issues over there. I don't know what it, their issue is with get turning a, wheel get nuts. Get a new but it's, CNC it's so machine, sad. It, get a new drill bit. Work it out, man. I don't know what you need to do. It's always Valtteri Bottas, man. If he goes it into is, the pits, he's screwed into a long pit every stop. Every time. Every time. And then they screwed over Zhao, too, just because mm-hmm. they're like, oh, oh you, you didn't do anything wrong. We'll do hey, something equal wrong. Equal rights, equal you. fights, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> point number two is just Alpine. I mean, I think that's one's, that one's pretty self There was a uh, five-second penalty for Pierre Gasly. Pierre so. Gasly... I will say this is a top five point, actually. We probably should have put this in there and made a top six for this week. Pierre Gasly is no longer 21st in a 20-driver championship. That is now Logan Sargent. <laughs> but he didn't race this way. <laughs> so, caveat, he's still 20th, I think, in my opinion. No, oh, so you just forgot Oliver Behrman existed. All right. Oliver Behrman gets the asterisk. <laughs> yeah, he gets an asterisk. <laughs> Williams, uh, you get the third point for the Willi- uh for the reasons foretold, that is what I was trying to say. Uh, the next one is just for Crofty. I'm pretty sure he has seen those Instagram memes. Where, no, it's just the Instagram pages where they're just all of racing commentary. Whenever they just com- say very suspicious sexual dialogue. Yeah, yeah. very sexual oriented dialogue. Um, but Crofty was saying that Stroll was edging... <laughs> Three times, <laughs> which he knows how to reach those younger viewers and okay. to get those laughs. But I was reading online; it was like everyone knew. They were like, "I heard this, and I knew this was going to be on this page." Yeah, we're going to rock minutes. up to Suzuka two weeks from now, and Crofty is going to be goon maxing oh, when he's doing this. It's <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> he has so to know. Bad. He has to know. I am a hundred percent in the disbelief that he does not like. He cannot just be like, "Oh, I, this is funny." I'm just I, gonna say edging three times. Hey, David Crow, he's just trying to fit in, man. And last point that's pretty important: you got Osama bin <laughs> Russell. You know, trying to steal Ferrari's thunder again. There's there's a uh, a funny uh, trend that in Carlos Sainz victories, George Russell likes to just throw it into the wall on the last lap. I will say that <laughs> Singapore wasn't his fault because Lando pushed the wall like a centimeter into the wind. I mean, the wall just turned it's into not, me. It, it's <laughs> not his fault. So it's all good. It's all good. But this time, uh, this, this time, time no. it, this time it was Alonzo's fault. The dirty and, air just <laughs> turned into him. Turbulence. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. We'll take your point over. That no. was top five or not five. 
Now I'm going to give you my F2 race recap for this week. It's going to be one of the last ones for a little bit, as Formula 2 will not be racing in Japan. But it was a very exciting qualifying session in Formula 2 this week, with pole being traded a couple times in the closing stages. Um, Kimi Antonelli was holding on to it for a while, which a lot of people were happy to see. And then Dennis Hauger came in um, at the very end and nipped it off of him. Um, him having been booted from the Red Bull Driver Academy in this offseason. It was very nice to see that he's he's bouncing back well. Um, so with this, Roman Stanek uh, qualified P10, so he started on pole for the sprint race, uh, given they do the reverse grid top 10s. So Stanek started on pole. There was a very interesting and crazy crash. Raven and I both watched this together, actually, with uh, Isaac Hadjar having started P4, I believe. Oh, sorry. Um, he started P3. Uh, he had cut across um, Pepe Marty and Gabriel Bordaletto, who both also had really good starts, um, but he cut across them um, with how good of a start he had and threw the both of them into the pit wall, um, which was it, it was just a very big, unusual crash. I mean, it was a crash five seconds into the race. Like they They were nowhere near the first corner yet. Um, it was just on the straight, very weird to see, um, kind of scary as well. If you're, you know, somebody in the pit lane, um, but it was a very close race with P2 being contested by five drivers at one point, which was really crazy. Um, it ended with Kimi Antonelli and Richard Vashore both spinning on their own. And then you had Paul Aaron, uh, running into Vashore after that. So the kids are obviously, they're still learning how to race wheel to wheel. And hey, hey that's important. You <laughs> the need, kids need... are still learning. It's okay. Give <laughs> them a few years. It's okay. Hadjar eventually did uh, go on to win this race on track, but he was later after the race, about an hour or two after, given a 10-second time penalty for that first lap, um, not even first corner, but drag um, crash that he that he created off the line. Um, so this promoted Stanek, who started on sprint race pole, to the win. And it's his first win in F2, so congrats to Roman Stanek. It's his second season, so he's he's getting up to grips now. Um, and then the feature race obviously started with um, Dennis Hauger on pole. Um, but it started clean with uh, Hauger, Antonelli, and Cushmine trading the lead over the first few laps for a while. And Hauger then, after the first round of pit stops, came out of the pits on very cold tires and just smacked into the wall at turn six, just like Alex Albon and George Russell. It, it, it is a very difficult set Corner. of corners. It's a hard one. Corner and just set of corners to get I right. I definitely sent it into the wall there. Because if, if, I mean, the problem is if you send it off that corner at all, you're into a gravel trap and you're essentially being... But then the hardest part about that is... The fact, like, well, you can't correct the car anymore. You're in, a, you're in the gravel. You're just sliding into the but wall. But it leads straight into a straightaway, mm -hmm. where if you don't get speed from that corner, any car behind you is getting by you, okay, and it, it repels you back onto the track mm -hmm. into those fast cars, like with it's George. Such, yeah, it's it's a risky, risky corner. But what but yeah, that happened. They put the safety car out for Dennis Hauger's crash. It's sad that he, he um, crashed from pole position, but that happens. Um, you had Isaac Hadjar, who had been disqualified in the last race. He pitted under the safety car, saving him an insane amount of time that ended up leading to him winning the race, given it was such a close-fought race that that safety car timing um, benefited him perfectly. Um, he won the race from Paul Aaron and Zane Maloney. And now you have Maloney leading the championship by 15 points on 62 from Paul Aaron and 47. So it was a very, very exciting race um, weekend for F2. So I was super happy to see that. We got no rally this week, but we got Kenya next week. So something that I'm, to talk I'm about. I'm super excited to watch gonna, that live. I'm going to watch, watch that, that live. So very exciting for that. Weck still got another month. Yeah. It's sad, but. We'll see the cars go fast soon. Brother. Nothing in the IndyCar world either. Nothing in IndyCar. And then we get to MotoGP, which I know you did not know what was happening, but I did. As Yeah, at Raven spent the night last night at my apartment, and I, you know, obviously I... <laughs> I was sleeping. Raven got up super early. I woke this up at 6 o'clock just because the couch is not that comfortable. And on what YouTube are you TV, do? we had... Beautiful access to the MotoGP race. Oh, no, this no, 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 no. It was not YouTube TV. I'm going to give the credit to HBO Max because... What? Yeah. 
Oh, I, no I way didn't, they want the licensing I rights to that. I didn't know that either. <laughs> but apparently they also have, like, WEC and stuff, too. Oh, wow. They might, know, they might have that. Rally as well. So shout out HBO Max. For just but I'll definitely let you take the Moto GP uh, section. Yeah. Today. I uh, got to watch, you know, everything from about lap four onward. So most of it, I didn't get to see the lights go out, which is always a bummer, but that's okay. Great race. Um, first five were up until fighting up until the last like few laps. Um, Mar- Jorge Martin wins the race after leading for almost all of it. The main piece in the news was that the eight-time world champion Mark Ma- uh, Marquez and the last MotoGP winner at Qatar, mm-hmm. uh, Francesco Banaya. Bag- Bagnaya, I, I think it is Banaya. I don't know. I think there's a G in there somewhere oh, that I just fair. left out. But they collide on turn five on the 23rd lap. And, you know, if you watch it, it's not really one of the other's fault. You know, one of them's trying to overtake on the outside. Is that just classic racing takes, incident? Takes, takes a t- tighter inside line. Mm-hmm. The guy on the inside kind of falls wide on his line. They bump. They both slide out. Kind of unfortunate, but Bagnaya retired after that, and they were fighting for third and fourth. Um, but Mark did not retire, and this is one of the cool things about MotoGP yeah. is that they crash and like slide out. Stewarts are like running over the barriers, coming out on the race. They get these guys up on their bikes and start pushing them, and they start racing again. So that's something that's really cool, and I think the technology there, yeah, which is really like, cool, they have so many layers in their suits and like actual padding and all. I was this gonna stuff. say because you have to think when they crash, their their bodies are the things that are sliding across. Oh yeah, but also. Like they are part of the arrow, so oh, yeah. you have to remember like weight, weight distribution. So like you can't wear too much padding if it's gonna move and all that stuff. There's a lot of nuances to it, just like F1, and of course. that's why it's the second most watched racing discretion in the world. But he ended up in uh, 16th, but still just out of the points. What can I say? Good race. It was an exciting one, but. I wish I got to watch the beginning. I want to, yeah, I I want to see my first MotoGP lights go out for a standing they're start. Just, they're, and the fact that they exciting. do bikes from a standing start is so oh, cool. Oh, it's thrilling, dude. Because I saw, it was last week I watched it. Yeah. One of the guys, his throttle got stuck on the oh, line. No. So it just starts rolling and like wiggling out of his grid spot. And there's yep. nothing you can do. But then they're like, He's trying to like get it back to the spot. The stewards are like, no, yep. now you got to go through the pits. Of course you do. And it was a huge ordeal last week, and uh, it was so crazy. But is there anything else? Any major news that we're missing? No. Like, there's the people that I need to reach out to, and hopefully get snag an interview. But uh, it's hard out here in the F1 world where. There's not a lot. There's not many F1 American journalists, but I'm gonna I'm gonna reach They're out. Slowly to you. gonna get there. I'm going to reach out to a lot of people, and <laughs> I'm praying that they respond. Raven will be in your DMs, guys. I will be in your DMs under the elite number deal. one fan. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all. I think that's all from me. And it's all from you. Yeah, I appreciate you guys sticking with us this week. Absolutely. A little bit of a late episode. Sorry, we're a little tired. It's okay. You can hear it in our voices. We, it had, we had to stay up till ooh, it's currently two. eleven fifteen PM on Sunday night. We stayed up till two last night. Two last night watching the race. Yeah. And I stayed up till like one, two on Friday. So yeah. I will definitely be getting some sleep. Definitely, definitely, definitely get I will some definitely, sleep. definitely, definitely be getting some sleep as well. But I will play uh play the outro music and Catch y'all next week. Nothing, no race See next guys, week. Uh, no race next week. So, gotta remind that, but we'll still have some news. Absolutely. Later. Catch you guys.